Terrific. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the June 11, 2012 meeting of the New York City Camp, uh, Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. Um, uh, and uh, at this meeting, we have one new participant, uh, J.C. Polanco, uh, who is here um, uh, representing Don Sandow. Um, J.C. is a uh, commissioner from the Bronx Board of Elections. We're very pleased to have you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, so I think uh, the first uh, first piece of business is to um, approve the minutes from our April 2nd, 2012 meeting. What is your motion? I move. Aye. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah, thank you. Um, so report of the chair. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so this morning um, uh, I gave testimony um, to the New York City Council um, with respect to resolution number 1343, um, which is an attempt by the council to, to support common sense use of technology to improve the way that we conduct our elections. And it's a, a relatively broad, broad ranging um, initiative to support things like online voter registration, um, to, but most specifically to improving the process of counting votes um, immediately as part of the election. Um, as, as many of you probably know, there, there's, a, there's a process to essentially uh, provide a real-time or near real-time estimate of, of, the, uh, of the results of the election followed by certification. And this resolution was an attempt to um, seek um, improvements in that process by the uh, Board of Elections. And uh, I had the uh, privilege of testifying this morning in support of that resolution. Um, as um, those of you know, um, we also um, came out this year with a um, with our 2011-2012 voter assistance um, annual report, and um, this meeting is our official hearing um, to take public comments on that report. Um, I don't have any updates. Okay. Um, I just have a couple of things. Can you hear me? Uh, one, in addition to the uh, and a report, we uh, just recently issued a, a report of uh, statistics uh, analyzing who votes in New York City. It's a, the work of a group of graduate students at NYU, uh, part of their Wagner School capstone program. And it has lots of very interesting statistics uh, about who votes and where they vote and why, not necessarily why, but what kinds of characteristics and it will be very helpful in focusing our work for the coming year on populations that are underrepresented in the voting pool, although, frankly, throwing dart in pretty much every place is underrepresented <coughs> in the voting pool in New York City because the voter turnout is so low. But, um, and I just wanted to comment on two things. Uh, uh, WFUV, the public radio station based at, at Fordham University, conducted an in-depth interview with Onita Caramares, our Director of Voter Assistance, about our activities, and that uh, will be aired on WFUV, aired on a broadcast, I don't know what it is on radio, um, <laughs> on June 23rd. Uh, and also this afternoon, probably being broadcast maybe while we're talking, uh, I was interviewed by WNYC about the capstone report that I was just talking about, about the statistics in voter participation in New York City. Um, so that should be you know, a snippet on the evening news tonight on WNYC. That's it. Well, just a couple of just a couple of things to update on. The last meeting we did talk about our surveys coming out for the June 26th election and the TLCs of the taxi uh, and limousine uh, the, with the taxis. So you can look for them. I'm encouraging everyone that if you're in a taxi on June 26th straight through July 2nd, the survey will run on all in all taxis. And um, we're, we're looking forward to see what the response will be like. And basically what we're asking people is, did they vote on election day and to report on some of their experiences? And it's a way for us to get some information um, on how people feel as well. So we're looking forward to that. Again, that's one of the efforts through our agency-based voter participation with the TLC. 
And the reason for that is each agency really looks for ways that they can reach to their constituents to bring a message of the importance of voting and to do their part in helping to strengthen uh, the electoral process. And for the TLC, they wanted it to serve as pretty much a reminder. So while they're piloting it this June 26, it will be again uh, during the general election also. And that gives us a little time for tweaking if we need it. <laughs> also, we have launched our NYC Votes Street Team. So it's a group of interns who will be working with us over the summer. The goal of that is to increase our capacity, basically. Uh, we, it's our unit, it's made, comprised of three people. <laughs> we are here tonight. And what we're trying to do is get to more communities throughout the city. What we have done is worked from the capstone report and looked at those areas uh, that are the lowest performing voting districts. And what we have found is they are in Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. And we're going into those communities. Each intern will have, at the very least, about 30 organizations that they will be contact, put in contact with. They will be providing training for those communities, reaching out to their constituents, doing voter drives each week, going to big events. Uh, so they will have a lot of work in trying to promote um, voter education and voter participation through these organizations that they will be paired with. So they will create voter action plans that we will be able to come back and share for each of these organizations. Uh, we've also enlisted the service of NYC Service, and we are really excited about that. It, with uh, New York City, we have, there are interns for every agency. So what, New, what NYC Service has done on our behalf is put out a pitch so since they ask all interns to provide community service throughout the summer, they have asked, they have pitched um, NYC votes as one of their community service components. And what they would do is get together once a week and really use their own personal social media accounts to promote voter participation, voter engagement, and they will be done they will do that through training that will be provided to us and our offices here. So we're really excited about what that is going to yield for that for us. Over the past two to three weeks, we have participated in Fleet Week, and there were over 8,000 people the day that we attended, which was on Memorial Day. And we went with our partners from Hot 97, which was really wonderful because they put a lot of cool back into voting, and we got a lot of people coming to our table who might not have otherwise. <laughs> come to visit us. <laughs> and while they were there, we were able to register a lot of people, as well as we were able to, something new that we have created, call an I Pledge to Vote on Election Day card. So the idea there is to get as much data from each person who we meet, so they sign and say that they will pledge to vote, and what we do is we tear it off and we mail it back to them close to election day. So it's a way for them to remember that they did make contact with us and that they pledged to say that they would vote. So and that they also pick up their email address or their, ta or their text Absolutely. Data. We ask for everything except <laughs> for their date of birth. But <laughs> they give us their name, their email, their cell number, so we can text them as well, send text mm -hmm. alerts and emails, and we have their home address so we can mail it back to them as well. Um, also with our partner, you'll hear more from them in the public session, but um, with Hot 97, we attended their annual Summer Jam concert, and that is attended by over 55,000 people who come through their village on their way to the concert. So there are messages from the stage there, and we provide a lot of um, voter registration on that day. So we did that as well. Well, the person with the really loud beating heart. <laughs> 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 Anita got well, so, so excited. So so <laughs> 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 Who is it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shana Tobin was out there, so she went up to check. Um, 
good either. <laughs> I don't know. I would stop. I don't know. Is microphone up? Uh, well, um, now we go into the, into the public hearing part of our... Well, I think Tony's going to give us a, a little update on pending legislation. Thank you. Um, thank you. And just to follow up a little bit about what Art talked about earlier, testified about some legislation. VAC has been um, uh, tracking legislation um, uh, for the past year, and we've weighed in on some pieces of legislation. Clearly, it's a big part of our mission because if we can be helpful in streamlining the process and making it easier for people to vote, it's certainly right in line with our overall goal and mission. You know, along that line, along those lines, before I get into a couple of, mention a couple pieces of legislation in the city council, you know, I'd like to recommend that we, we move to the next stage of sort of formalizing a little bit more our legislative efforts because I think that we've been doing it in a way that's been a little bit ad hoc just because as we develop what we're doing here, uh, but I think we probably can take a much more, I think, proactive approach and maybe uh, be a catalyst for putting together some groups that would want to get behind much of this legislation, I would imagine, is, you know, there's always the devils in the details, but the concept usually seems to be universal of making things easier for people to get to, to vote. So I think we could be a strong catalyst to organize some groups and see if we can uh, be more proactive on legislation, both city and state, and certainly the state is where a lot of this has to rest, but I'd make a recommendation that we see if we can uh, uh, work to put together something a little bit more structured so that we are not just responding as it comes in the door, maybe make some recommendations for legislation. <coughs> we have a whole agenda in our report, which some, some people may comment on, which I think we could start right there and just keep moving forward with those initiatives. So um, put that out for the, for the group to think about and, and see if we can move forward on that. Um, there are a bunch of pieces of legislation that are making their way at various stages through the city council. And I'll just touch on a few just so we have a sense because we're not sure if any of them, other than the one that Art uh, testified at earlier, are, are fully developed to enough detail that they're ready to be voted on. But uh, Councilman Lander has one out there that would require the Board of Elections to report data uh, required by the mayor's management report for the city council. Again, we need to review that and see whether that makes sense. It's it's in it's sort of in development stages. Um, uh, Lappin, Councilwoman Lappin, has a uh, a bill that would establish a poll worker program and give incentive for municip municipal workers to uh, work on election day. Um, uh, you know, again, the devil's in the details of how that would work, but encouraging more people to become part of the pool for election workers. Um, Councilman Williams has a bill out there that would require the Board of Elections to report for particular city agencies the number of New Yorkers who completed voter registration forms while seeking city services. Um, and uh, there's another bill by Councilman Greenfield that would require voter registration forms to be provided to parents enrolling children in schools would be a good idea. Uh, uh, Councilwoman uh, Dickens would, has a bill that would require Campaign Finance Board to send email notifications of election dates, deadlines, and ballots to registered voters and collect email addresses. We've talked about that bill before. It's still out there. Um, so that's just a sample of some of the bills, but uh, we have a whole legislative list of items that we'd like to see at the state level that's in our report and uh, I think it would be good to put together a, a, a more formalized structure for that, put together possibly a coalition of groups to kind of get behind those and be more proactive about some of the legislation, but these are the ones that are just pending out there. We haven't taken a position on many of them just because a lot of them are not developed yet, but as they get closer, we'll come back and make a recommendation as to whether or not we should take any action or support or not support a particular bill. That's what we are. That's terrific. I mean, just, let me just ask you a question. I think it's really interesting that um, all these different efforts are so, so fragmented at this point. Um, you know, there seems to be a, a kind of a need as well for some kind of a, a center of gravity for those efforts. Um, and, and looking through this, have you seen anything like that? Is that something that we should be doing more of? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of the idea. I think there are some groups out there that would welcome our uh, being a catalyst for organizing and everybody brings to the table a different constituency. And I think as a quasi-governmental agency, I think we could bring some support to things that maybe are not getting the traction that they should be getting. But if they're clearly within our our mandate, I think you know it's incumbent upon us to to be part of that coalition and help maybe form it. And maybe we have either more resources, even though we don't have a ton of resources, but we have more resources than they might have to bring people together. And I'm sure the elected officials who are trying to move forward a good bill would appreciate a, a boost and a support from a, a broader coalition. Thank you, Kirk, for for it. Thanks so much. Um, so now I guess we'll kick, we'll start the hearing part of, um, of our agenda. Um, I, I do want to just uh, 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 read a little bit from the uh, from the report. There are things here that I think are, are quite important for us to, to remember. Um, the opening paragraph um, is, is I think terrific. It's basically all New Yorkers have the right to choose their leaders through free democratic elections. Over the past century, many Americans have fought and died to preserve or extend that right in wars abroad and here at home. Hard won political and legal struggles have helped open the political process to practically every American who wants to take part. Yet too many New Yorkers are sitting out our election. The challenge is to make New Yorkers reconnect to their government. And um, one of the things here that we're, we're, we're doing, and I think this comes through in the report and through our ongoing effort, is the goal is to engage New Yorkers more directly in civic life using all the tools available in this technologically connected age. Um, achieving real measurable growth in civic engagement requires a commitment to widespread efforts to engage with large numbers of voters by leveraging new technologies and building partnerships. And um, this, is, this is really an important part of what we're doing. And we say, you know, change won't come overnight, but the potential is boundless and we must leverage the tools that we have to reach a statistically significant portion of New York City's six million voting age citizens. And um, what I'd like to point out is that um, this is actually the first year of an existence for the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. Um, you know, the, the work that Tony's done, the work that Zania has done, is certainly a continuation of past efforts, but we have an opportunity to consolidate those efforts and really become a focal point for a lot of the efforts that are happening um, in the government and then being the point of connection, an open API, if you will, to what's happening out there in the civic sphere. Um, we, um, it took us almost a full year to actually get our full complement of members, um, but it's terrific that we have them now. Um, as mentioned before, leveraging technology has been, is, has been and, and will be um, a tremendous focus of the efforts that we, uh, we um, pursue in the coming months. Um, and um, other areas that I think really deserve sort of mention are really expanding our outreach to constituencies within the city. And um, I want to commend Anita for the work that she's been doing, in particular reaching out to youth voters, and, and Cheyenne as well, thank you, for all of your good work. Um, but also reaching out to voters in, in every aspect of the community, for women, military, um, uh, veterans, um, and current military. Um, officers and, and, and enrolled folks, um, we're trying to do an effort to reach out to everybody who has an interest in voting and get them more engaged both in person as well as using technology. So I guess with that, we'll start with the agenda. We have, um, Anita, do you want to introduce some, some of our guests? Please. If you indulge me, we actually need to make a change, but I, if you give me, I, I would actually <coughs> Bear my indulgence. I wanted to just show you. Uh, Anita talked about our street teams, and um, you know, I, I really want. This is a real innovation, and I really commend you know her staff, or Anita and her staff, for coming up with this idea of sending a group of interns out into the city to work with community groups during the summer when people have a lot of outdoor events. Lots of people get together. It's really the perfect time for that. And so I just wanted. Chan's going to show you. What, this is our T-shirt that we. Uh, developed to, you know, for our street teams to wear when they're off doing their work at these big events. I brought extras for you guys. <laughs> um, 
so I just wanted to share that with you. And um, uh, Commissioner Polanco had asked if he could go first. So we, if we were indulged, we'll switch the agenda so that he, uh, the, we have a report from the New York City Board of Elections before um, we have the report from our uh, partners. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate uh, the switching schedule. Again, my name is J.C. Polanco. I'm a commissioner at the Board of Elections. And I'm here on behalf of Don Sandow who's still at the board uh, working with the assembly staff for Assemblyman Kavanaugh on finalizing uh, the bill for the closing procedures of our poll sites. So it's something that we are working very uh, hard on with the city council and with some of the testimony you gave today uh, should be very beneficial. So we're, we're still there and we haven't uh, had a final bill yet. Um, but again, last week we testified uh, in front of the city council uh, requesting additional funding, obviously, uh, as we move on to this new election year, all, everyone here is aware of uh, the fact that we have three primaries uh, in New York City this time, and it's going to be a very difficult year financially for the board. Uh, the monies that we need were not uh, funded by the executive budget, so the, the staff went to the city council, like we do every year, hat in hand, um, in an effort uh, for us to secure the proper funding necessary for these elections. Um, as you know, we have special elections that come up. Uh, we just finished finally certifying the special election out in Brooklyn. Um, each election is roughly, uh, I know people sometimes wonder, how much is each election? At our best, they're roughly $20 million each, not including specials that take place across the city. Um, these things require monies. As you know, we have a new voting system. Uh, the training for these uh, new poll workers and on these new voting systems requires the millions of dollars. Um, the Department of Justice is now mandating New York City to recognize Bengali as a language. Um, this has added an, an additional half a million dollars to the Board of Elections budget when it comes to sending our legally mandated mailers for every registered voter across the city. Um, these are just some of the things that we requested from the City Council uh, as far as the funding that's necessary for us to carry out the free and fair elections Chairman Chang talks about earlier. Um, and something else that the Chairman refers to that the Board is working very diligently on is including technological advancements and improving the use of technologies in our voting process. Um, as all of you know, last year the Board of Elections, or early, early last year we were working very diligently. We finally finalized it late last year going into this year. But now we have sample online ballots for voters across the city to be able to log on onto our website and actually print out a sample ballot of what they will see when they come to their poll sites on election day. Uh, this was something that we worked very closely with the City Council on, many good government groups that are here today, including VAC, uh, and making sure that it happens. Um, but we're not stopping there. We're, we're also going to look at the use of tablets for up-to-the-minute reporting so that we can trace with accuracy, up-to-the-minute, what is going on, what's wrong, how can we best address any failures in scanners or any needs that a poll site may need. Um, this is costing us... Um, extra money. As all of you know, this, this wasn't funded this year. But again, it's an effort for us to include new technologies, as the Chairman mentioned, in our voting processes. Um, in addition to that, the Board of Elections is working on developing an app um, that is going to be able to be seen on Blackberries and on Droids and on iPhones and on other platforms. So that if there's a voter in New York City that needs to know where their poll site is, they can simply go to their app and find out where it is, is it open, what time they're, they're open, until everybody knows it's 6 to 9, but all of the relevant information will be available on this application. These are some of the things we're doing. And, and finally, this, there's two other things that we have incorporated at the board that I think are very important um, as far as technology is concerned, and that is um, having voters report on Twitter uh, and on Facebook um, how their experience has been uh, at the poll site. Because of our, and Valerie Vasquez is here, she spearheads our public uh, education efforts as well as our public relations and media. Uh, but she's, she's able to trace these things and uh, we're able to know as commissioners what's going on as well as our key staff to be able to deploy the necessary staff to either replace a scanner, make sure we have the requisite number of poll workers at a specific poll site. These are just some of the things that we're doing as we move the board into the 21st century. Um, we're going to continue improving, uh, continue streamlining, continue modernizing our system so that every New Yorker is confident and comfortable in this new system. Uh, but we can't stop here. We need to make sure the City Council funds these elections appropriately um, so that we can continue to plan for successful elections um, moving forward. Now, oh, thank you, Valerie. Um, I, I'm, she serves as a ventriloquist, too. Uh, um, we have uh, recruited a great deal of workers. As all of you know, we have a pool of about 60,000 poll workers. 
Um, we recruited over 3,361 poll workers this, just this year alone. And it's important that we get the best and brightest poll workers with these new voting systems. You know, customer care is very important to us at the board. We want to make sure that New Yorkers are confident and comfortable in this new system. It's a new system. It's a scary system to many voters. No matter how much we say it's as easy as one, two, three, when you first go there and you look at the font and, you, and you, you're concerned about that paper and you're concerned about how to go about it, you want to make sure you have a poll worker that's going to make you feel comfortable there. Um, so we're recruiting uh, from the city universities where we're working very closely with the good government groups and increasing the size of our applicant pool um, so that we can have some technologically savvy poll workers, which I think will be important moving forward. And in addition, part of our request of the city council just last week was asking them to continue giving us the incentive to provide poll workers at $75 an election. Um, it's very important that we incentivize our best and brightest to stay on and serve in this year's election. You know, this, this year we may have ter record turnout in the presidential election. Last year, to, last presidential election in 2008, we had 2.6 million New Yorkers come out and vote. This year, we may have more. And with, this will be the first time that many voters are going to see this new system. So it's very important that we have the best poll workers possible, incentivize them to continue coming because it is through con the continuum of their participation that we uh, continue to improve upon their experience and provide excellent customer service for our voters. Um, so one of the things we're requesting is the city council fund the incentive pay uh, so that we can retain uh, our poll workers. I hope I, I was clear. I hope I didn't miss anything. Valerie, you would throw something at me. Um, and if I can't answer any questions, Chairman, that your, that your board may have. I have a question, Commissioner. Um, do you know if the poll site information has been, the poll site locator has been updated at this point? I know as of last week it hadn't been updated. Obviously, it's a tough type timeline when you have redistricting and then these elections like this. But do you know if that's been updated? If not, when it would be? For September and the next coming weeks, we'll have it updated to reflect the September lines, and it is up to date for June. So the June is up to date. Okay. So we have not posted the sample ballots as of yet. We're hoping that the sample ballots are live generally two weeks before the election, so they should be upcoming. I have a question. Uh, the election, the, the primaries, uh, have been changed from in September. From the 11th to the 13th, are you going to be, what efforts are you going to be making to make sure that people are aware of that change since people are normally used to voting on a Tuesday? Well, one of the things, again, we requested from the City Council was the additional funding for the uh, citywide mailer uh, that will make sure New Yorkers know what date is the primary, they'll know their poll site and the hours um, of their uh, election. So every voter is going to get in the mail a September 13th a notice from the New York City Board of Elections. But because of the additional language requirement, we're asking the city council to fund the fact that we now have to have Bengali as a language on the information. But we will make sure that every board of New York City has it. Now, as far as um, what, what we're legally required at the Board of Elections to do, we go above and beyond. Um, we, we make sure that every voter knows that the September 13th will be the date of the primary. Okay. And do you make sure they know that how this affects the change, for, change with respect to registration for voting? Because that's affected too much. Well, you know, what's good is that the New York City Board of Elections just last week extended the deadline until Sunday night because legally it's Friday at 5 o'clock and I believe the date is, uh, do you remember it's August 19th? August, no. No, August 19th, but we're actually allowing... No, the August 19th is a Sunday. It's a Sunday night. It well, it would have been August, it would have been August 17th right. by midnight, but the commissioners at the board have extended the deadline to Sunday midnight at 42 hours. Okay. And, and this is going to advertise them now. We're advertising it through local community groups and on our website. Okay. And we're actually asking the elected officials to put them in their newsletters and good government groups that are here in the audience and members of the, com of the commission to uh, relay that to your constituents. Okay. If I may, there's also, we're legally required to take ads in local newspapers throughout mm -hmm. the city. So not only in English, but also in the covered languages, we also advertise. And there are three ads that are prior to each election. There's one uh, just in, uh, we'll give the date of the election and it appears generally three days prior to the election. Uh, we'll also have one ad with the candidates list and the third ad that appears actually on election day. So well, there are numerous um, advertisements that we are legally required. But that's also, that's something that we have to purchase space in. So we work with our partners in community newspapers asking that we leverage the space and that they give us earned media to help us spread the word. So I have a question. So um, I think the, um, 
and everybody's well aware of the declining readership of print newspapers, and um, the increase in the use of Facebook and, and Twitter as a means for getting news. Um, so in, in the context of that declining readership, is uh, the uh, Board of Elections making offsetting efforts in, in social media? We are. Yeah, we are. I mean, Valerie's constantly updating information on Twitter. I actually tweeted that I was here with you today, Jerry. Actually, <laughs> as I sat here. So, <laughs> true story. So we do we do keep our voters. Uh, we, we we actually launch a massive campaign to have people actually like our page. Right. Um, and we work with our good government groups to get more names. And we we're actually update anything right. that's possible. Have you asked uh, Facebook approach Facebook or Twitter to find out whether they can give you any pro bono advertising? We've been working with them. They haven't done pro bono. They've given us reduced rates mm -hmm. for not for profit, I think but not for bono. Target quite well. Yes, so absolutely. Uh, I mean, when we did, I mean, for the in the for 2009 election, we did uh, we, or 2010, I guess when we when the voter guide was coming out, for, uh, we sent we put Facebook ads. You know, so we. we so I think part of our voter assistance, you know, as a joint project, we can always work together to, you know, we'll put out. We certainly have, you know, whenever she goes out, put, passes out cards that have all the election dates on them. And you know, this was our final piece was what the registration date was, that August 19th, August 17th issue. And, um, uh, but the cards go out and we do it on, we Twitter, we tweet the dates and we put it on our Facebook page too. And um, so it's, you know, kind of a joint building on. Mm -hmm. Each other. Commissioner Polenko, I have a question for you. You talked about the sample ballots, and clearly, when we're out in the community a lot and we're providing a lot of training, when you say that this year most New Yorkers will be first time voters, is absolutely correct. If the public could have access to sample ballots, maybe even similar to the ice cream ballots you did before, but when we go out, if we could show people, this is what you're going to vote on so they can get accustomed to it. Can we have access to that? It's actually online. If you go to our website, you can actually see the sample ballot. And, and we can print, print it, it the same way? Yeah. Absolutely. It's okay. a, it's a, it, it looks, it's, a, it's almost, it's an exact replica in terms of design, but it doesn't have the timing mark, so no one could actually enter the poll site and, and mark a ballot, their ballot using that photocopy. But yes, it is identical to that person's specific ED80. Okay. But those are only available, the ones for each yeah. election are only, only available, available two weeks before, before. The, when the ballot is set. So we're, right. I think what Anita's talking about is like, well, you know when you did last oh, year, the ice cream ballot, whether you have a similar thing. Well, do we have any extras that we, we can do. provide? We have those. We have, we have some ice cream ballots left, and we also have um, their demo, because we'll use them for testing and training. So we right, can get that's what I meant. Yes, if we could have access to those, it would be really helpful. Okay, yeah, we can definitely do that. Absolutely. And, and I just wanted to also come in because when we went out to Fleet Week, the Board of Elections went with us as well. And I think we did a lot of poll worker recruitment there. I think we got over 50 people who signed up that day. So thank you very much. And I think that's what we're trying to do is team up more as well. We're trying to send teams out together to so be more of an impact. I, I, I just want to echo that comment because when you hear the challenges that you're facing and the things that you're trying to do, I mean, our, the mission of both of our organizations is so closely intertwined that working together, and I appreciate that you guys are always here and, and willing to work together on these kind of projects that make such a big difference. And, you know, I think that can extend also to some of the legislation to the extent that we have it. We agree on a piece of legislation that might work, but, uh, um, but working together is, I think, critical because everything that you enumerated earlier if the voter doesn't have a good experience, if the voter doesn't know there's an election, we're trying to get that information out there, we're trying to get it out there. But if they don't know those things, or they have a bad experience, they're not coming back. Um, and I love your app idea, because voters, one of the biggest frustrations they have is where do they vote? Mm -hmm. And even when they go there, sometimes they're in the wrong place, they change a poll site. So the app, I think, is a great idea. We just need to get funded. <laughs> Well, that would be a good thing. Yeah, be able to, that might actually be a good thing to, uh, to the uh, open source community um, here in New York. And I would say that one of the things that, that I think is, 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 is of great interest would also be the building of reminders, the alerts for when to vote, where to vote, as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? Thank you.
Thank you. Are there any, by the way, are you uh, um, are you taking off? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Are there, are there any members of the public who'd like to ask any questions of uh, Commissioner Planka before he has to depart? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next. Um, uh, so we have um, community groups and partners that I think Anita will, will introduce. Okay. Anita, you're the yes. floor. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was happy, you know, for this, um, our, our next annual meeting, what we do is we try to invite some of our partners in as well to talk about the projects that we've been working on together. They are still, you know, very organic. We continue to grow. The first one I'm going to invite up is Angelique Tyree from Hot 97 Hip Hop Votes. She's their publicist and, pro and one of their project managers. Um, our, our partnership with Hot 97 has been about four years now. We're just really excited about meeting new people there all the time. Thank you. Okay. Angelique. So, hello, I'm Angelique. Sorry for being a little late. Um, I'll just briefly talk about what Hip Hop Votes is at Hot 97. I don't know if you all are aware of it. Um, as Nita stated, we began this um, the service project four years ago, and it's expanded since then. Um, well, actually, I'm going to also say this. I'm here on behalf of Denisha Benjamin. Uh, she just said, like contacted me at the last minute and told me to come out and let you all know about Hip Hop Votes. So sorry if I see you a little flustered or <laughs> all over the place. But um, basically, we met with NYC Votes a couple months ago where Anita was there, and we discussed our partnership um, and joining with Rock the Vote. Uh, Voto Latino and different organizations with um, NYC Votes for Hip Hop Votes. Um, and from that, we felt like it would be an excellent match. And our aim is basically to reach the hip hop community, like the Hot 97 listeners. And we feel like our jocks and, you know, our, our uh, I guess our presence in New York will definitely be a huge asset to the new, uh, NYC Votes. Um, briefly, what we've done so far, we haven't had a chance to really, I guess, do as much as we want to with hip hop votes because we were in the whole summer jam mode for the past few months. So now that it's summer, we're done with summer jam, we're really focusing on hip hop votes. But what we've done prior to summer jam was, um, well actually at the summer jam event, we had over 55,000 people to attend and voters assistance was actually there and was able to reach a crowd of 55,000 who attended the festival village. So their message was able to expand across a lot of people who listened to High 97. Um, we also had um, a Push for Peace event. I don't know if you all are aware of the Push for Peace event we had in the Bronx in May. It's with Lisa Evers. She's a street soldier um, host, and also she's a host for Fox. And basically what that event is, is they, it was, a, uh, I believe it was an audience of 300 people who were there, um, ranging from ages 5 to like 70. And basically they were talking about the importance of getting gang violence um, out of the streets of the Bronx. And basically, um, promoting positive changes and choices for the youth in that community. So we were able to register 50 people there out of 300, and we are able to expand our message to 500, well, 300 to 500 people. Um, also, at Fleet Week, um, during Memorial Day weekend, we had our street team assist voter assistance, uh, and as Anita had mentioned, we were able to register over 50 new voters, 47 to 50 new voters. Mm -hmm. And we were able to engage over 500 people during that event as well. Um, and lastly, like I said before, um, Hip Hop Votes, we're definitely trying to expand our presence in NYC over the summer. Um, we're just now getting done with Summer Jam, so that's going to be like my main focus starting like tomorrow, um, to definitely engage like the Hot 97 listeners. Um, we have a digital page um, for Hip Hop Votes on our website, hot97.com, and there we partnered with uh, Rock the Vote, where voters are actually able to go online and vote, because we know not everyone wants to have the paper application and you know, fill it out. So we have that um, online and that's readily accessible to them. And we also have paper forms in uh, Spanish and English for Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York for voters too. So we have that in the offices and we also bring that to our events with us as well to try to get more people to register to vote. And I think what we're also hearing from Angelique was as she has to go down that trail of all those papers that people need to register to vote, that is one of the things that we're hearing when we go out with Hot 97, is that their um, audience want to be able to register to vote electronically. So that is a big barrier um, to reaching out to those audiences for sure. And so far we have 200 people online who register to vote, as opposed to like the 50 that we had at the Pusher Peace event and you know, the other events that we're going to. So we definitely, like our online presence is definitely like a major, you know, 
I guess, part of our whole uh, campaign. So. And, and how do you said donating all of this time and effort to this campaign? Yes, um, we actually have, um, I don't know if you've heard of our foundation, it's called the Hip Hop Has Heart Foundation. And through that, we have funds that we have that are um, accessible for this, me, for this Hip Hop Votes campaign. So we have um, pens, t-shirts, things, like different things that we're also going to give out as like, you know, just prizes and stuff for people, incentives for people to vote. Um, so yeah, it's all coming from our foundation, that money is. Thank you for doing that. You're welcome. That How many people do you have working with you? Right now, it was me and another guy, um, but you know, Walker works with us anymore. So I have a team that I'm getting together starting this week um, that's going to start like, helping me with this. Um, I'm also working with Anisha Benjamin, who's a senior director of promotions. And we're gonna like, but we also have a street team that's working with us as well. That means have a street team which consists of 30 people. So when they go out into events, they have like the voter registrations forms with them. They're aware of how they're supposed to, you know, promote like voter registration and things like that as well. How many uh, how many people did they do register in the past year? In the past year, um, well, since this is new, and I'm just I'm just now the project manager for this um, campaign. We've registered so far. 200 online, 50 at the Push for Peace, um, 50 with um, Anita at the Fleet Week. So, around 300 plus, I would say so far. And that's not even like heavily pushing. That's the past how long? I'm sorry, that's, we started this campaign, I want to say in March, like late early March. So it's, you know, fairly new. We haven't really pushed it as much as we, you know, want to because our focus has been on like a lot of things. But now that, you know, our, Schedules are calming down a little bit, which I'm not really like hone in on this hip hop folks campaign. Perfect. I'm just interested, in just <coughs> specifically, how do you how do you run the online registration piece of it? So what we do, we we actually we also we integrate it with our social media campaign. So with our Twitter um, feed, we have at least six Twitter posts that run that give like different things. Like for one, for instance, we have a poll on our digital site that says, you know, what community um, or what um, what community issue has like the major has a major impact on you, and we'll run that through our Twitter feed, and then people will or viewers are able to click on the link and are directed to the page, and right on the page it has register here to vote. So uh, I guess the viewers are able to go on the site and see that they're able to vote, and we also try to push that initiative through like our Twitter and Facebook as well. So they have to print the registration form and then mail it in. No, they they can actually register online because um, Rock the Vote. Hmm? Yeah, rock they the probably vote. pull it. Oh, well, you know what? Rock the vote. They have a national form, so that yeah, it's a national for form. some of the other states, but definitely not for New York State. Oh, New right. York people would need the yeah. original signature, right. and they have a broader reach, so they go connect. Yeah, that was a big phrase. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. Something new every day. I would like to ask you a question. <laughs> yes. Uh, do you run the public service announcement on the radio about this campaign? We're actually starting that next week. Okay. How soon will you be running those announcements? Because I would think that that would be even more a more uh, you know more effective way of reaching people. Absolutely. We're going to actually start that next week, and we also have um, here's what's hot, and that's like our regular like that's what we use our cl our clients use to run their. Um, you know, there are different products and things like that online. I mean, on air. So we're going to actually start running PSAs, which is like once or twice. And I can't really explain it. It's really, it gets really technical in <laughs> radio terms, but it's like a lower level. Mm -hmm. So the PSAs don't run as often as what the Here's What Hots run. Okay. And since we're like really trying to push voter registration, we're going to start doing that like effectively immediately. Like next week, we're going to start okay. running the Here's What Hots. So you'll hear it at least four times a day. Oh, so I guess that's really directed. I'm sorry. Which, which, were they directed to register or were they directed to vote? Are they, it's directed to a particular website or a particular... Well, we try to get them to register through hotmain7.com through our voter registration. Right. Yeah, that's what we directed. We'd but love to. Can you share those, get those statistics, share those statistics Absolutely. with us? We'd love to see those. Absolutely. Like, if I had more time, I'm sorry, I would have had the statistics printed out for you guys great. so you guys to see like how many people are voting. And it so says important. like the demographics in New York. It has all that broken down for you, so... <laughs> Yeah, it, and it might be, I don't know, but it might be worthwhile for you to encourage people to call like 311 to find out where they can go to register to. Because, I mean, it might be just, since it is, since you can't register online to vote in New York, it might be worthwhile to just tell them to call 311 to find out. Or the, the number of the Board of Elections, I don't think they would. Do you all have like a contact? As well, sure, and I can give you all yeah. that. Yeah. 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 
Because three one one will send them back to us. Oh, okay, well, then you should give them. Right. Yeah. right. So I'll just connect with him. Sure. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> One other thing I'd like to say while Angelique is here is I really want to commend Hot 97 because they have been through a transition. Uh, I hope that's okay to talk about. No, that's where we can talk. That's okay. another reason why. <laughs> yeah, we're kind of all over the place. But yeah. yes, because it was Hot 97 and Kiss FM, mm -hmm. and so they have moved away from each other. So it was Hot 97 left standing, mm -hmm. and it was in the middle of us, you know, trying to really build our plan together. And they continued to, you know, they continued on with us, and they are very, very committed, as you can hear, to really grow hip hop votes. Um, and one of the things that we're talking about as well, we've been dis discussing with external affairs here at CFB, is to have a texting component because those are one of the things that we wanted to be able to do from the concerts. That when they have wonderful celebrities on stage, and if they could say, if you'd like to register to vote, text your information to here, that, that we're, we're trying to develop more tools together that they can use so we can get more. Uh, of an audience driven our area or driven into the right area at least. Right. Uh, so and, and as they did, they supported our youth poet laureate program last November, and they did PSAs and they ran them very, very, very heavily. Thank you. Any other questions? Questions for the public? Mm -hmm. Marjorie. I, I just wondered what are the top issues that concern them in their communities. Are they local or are they general? I mean, the war in Syria or what are? They? Well, the questions that are well, the question that's asked the poll is what community issue directly affects you? And the main thing that we're getting is the rent. So that's like a major issue that yeah. you know affects our community, or the New York City community, uh, community. But this poll is not only open to just the New York City committee. So I don't know if the statistics may be flawed for New York City because it's open. To, it's open up to like the entire world. Anyone who has access to .com, but that's the main issue that we're seeing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's perfect. You're welcome. Thank you for all your work. No problem. Thank you. The next person who's going to join us is um, a good friend, Clarice Joins. She is the Deputy Commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs. Um, Clarice has been always very committed to voter participation and voter education. And this year has really increased the efforts of their office um, to work with NYC Votes. Good evening. Um, as I need to introduce myself, um, not only am I the Deputy Commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs, but I'm here on behalf of Commissioner Terrence Holliday and the Veterans of New York City. Um, I've known Anita for quite a while, and when she brought to my attention the issue of absentee ballot voting to, in the veterans community, or I should say the service members community um, across the nation and the, and the appalling statistics of voting in New York, and when I say appalling, because being a homegrown New Yorker, and knowing that New York is such, you know, we're at the bottom of the barrel on voting. Um, I took it on myself, not only in my role of leading veterans in New York City, but also as a personal, you know, person, a, 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 a person who is living in Queens, living in New York, and knowing that voting is very important. So one of the things that we um, were able to get together and do was to work with the intrepid and, um, to be able to have voting, you know, the outreach on the Intrepid during Fleet Week, which took place this year from uh, the 23rd of May to the 30th of May. And as Anita had said, they were able to successfully register 50 um, voters. Um, just to let you know why the number is not higher, um, when you talk about visiting sailors, posties, and Marines who come for Fleet Week, they come from all over the country. And we weren't so much concerned that we weren't going to reach just, you know, New Yorkers. The, the idea of voting, getting the word out. We wanted to be able to spread the word to the audience that uses absentee ballots. And that's the service members and their families, which a lot of people are not aware of. They concentrate on the service members themselves. But you have to remember, you have a population of the families that are stationed overseas with the active duty um, member. And then you also have federal employees, which we found out through, again, working with not only the um, military, but working with the Federal Voter Assistance Program. And to be able to come together and talk about um, the possible audience when you talk about absentee ballot voting. 
um, one of the statistics that we were able to find that in New York State alone we have about 90,000 reserve active duty and National Guard members in New York State. And so this concerns them, absentee ballot uh, registration. And then also if they're, you know, New Yorkers and, you know, they have to be able to get their vote in on time and have their ballot um, cast, you know, not only for themselves, again, for their family members. So um, that's what we were able to do is to form this partnership in which it was successful, um, getting the word out. Um, we also have 207,000 veterans in the five boroughs. And the word of, you know, getting out um, the word to the community saying where to vote, how to get the information out. Um, MOVA has a website, so we'll be putting that information. In fact, it's there. Um, we've always kept a link to voter, you know, voter assistance and everything, but we'll be updating it to go with the new New York Votes campaign. And then also we're on Facebook and we're on Twitter. And the reasons why we use that is to get information not only about, out about what we're doing at MOVA, but the population of veterans that are coming out from this war, they're the younger generation, and that's how they get their information. So the idea I heard uh, mentioning about an app, it's very important because that's how they get their information even from us about um, veterans' benefits. Um, so being updated on social media is very important because that's how they get a lot of their information. We just um, went live on YouTube, so if you have anything that needs to be streamed there, we definitely will welcome any information that can be streamed that way as well. Um, because we really take this very seriously. I know um, Mayor Bloomberg has given directions to all city agencies to get the information out as much as possible about voting. Um, you know, and it's, it's not a, um, a political thing, it's, it's about personal right. And we take that very, very seriously to get that information out. I have I have two questions. Sure. First, I want I wonder um, what efforts, if any, do you make to get uh, registered and get turned out from homeless veterans? Well, the whole thing, homeless veterans, we do have contacts with the shelters in New York, mm -hmm. so we do have that information that goes um, through the shelter system, and that's through our Department of Homeless Services, mm -hmm. and we do work um, together closely with them. We have um, Board Avenue Veterans Residence in Queens, who are veterans up in the Bronx. We also have the East 119th Street Shelter in Manhattan and a couple of new shelters that have popped up in the area. So we do get the information out to them okay. and make sure that they're registered. Okay. And I have another question. Do you and what you know what relationships you work with like community groups like Black Vets for Social Justice Absolutely. and all those groups to help them register and when you well, we don't we don't run their we don't run their registration efforts, but they do get involved. Um, we've had a partnership with Black Vets since we've been um, established since 1987, so we know the the CEO there, um, the new one, Wendy McClinton. Mm -hmm. I'm very familiar with her. In fact, I was just with her on Memorial Day. They just had their first uh, Memorial yeah, they had Day parade. Best, so, yes, absolutely. So we do we do work with the community based organizations in getting the information out. And we take as much information as we get from Anita and we, when we um, go to any ceremonies or events or we're out and about, we're always taking pamphlets and information with us. So we get the word out by any means necessary, getting it out and about to the community. All right, thank you. Yes, you're very welcome. Thank and you. through Clarice, we've actually, she's given us the names of those um, homes throughout the city and we've gone, we've done voter registration drives and as well as provide the training in each of those um, locations. Because we have about 400 different chapters of veterans organizations across the five boroughs. So this is, again, this is, this will be going on until we need to tell us we to stop, which uh, I don't think that's going to happen. I have, a couple, I have a couple questions. <laughs> sure, very, sure. Very quickly, uh, sure. How do you describe the level of interest across all these different groups? Very, very high. Because when you're talking about the veterans community, you're talking about um, speaking to the choir, so to speak. You're talking great. about a, a great a, a group of um, people who are out there defending your rights as an American. So voting is very high um, on, that, on that scale. So when you, you, know, you start sharing with them the information, it's just like when Anita came to me and said, you know, New York State, 47th and voting in the nation overall. I said, how could that happen? I'm a veteran myself. That's, to me, that's egregious. It's, it's just ridiculous. Any way we can get the word out to help. So when we share that information and we encourage visiting service members, even if they're not from New York, because the word gets out, yep. you share the information, you say, have you filled out, you know, for you know, your state, your absentee ballot, have you met the deadline? And most of the time, it's a yes. 
but we want to make sure that that information gets out and about and that they don't just, um, the service members look at themselves, but again, that they bring their families into it because a service member who is married, who has children, because you have to remember, you're talking about the entire family and anybody that's age of 18, they're eligible to vote. So it's a reminder to them if they do have um, young teens in their family that are voting for the first time, that they get that information that, that so that when they're filling out their ballot, their absentee ballot, that they're not forgetting their teenagers that are eligible to vote. Okay. I think one thing I would, I would just encourage you to do among your different groups is if, to the extent that they're using Twitter, if they have issues related to voting, any challenges, difficulties, they should tweet and they should use the BOE's hashtag. What's your hashtag? BOE votes. Okay, and uh, there's also NYC votes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we have a coordinated effort to follow those things. And I think the board can get out and we look for ways to remove impediments to people actually participating. Absolutely. Any other questions? Thank you for all your work. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Chairman. Thank you. going to have a, a presentation from the very talented students who prepared our capstone report. They're going to just uh, do a presentation and uh, kind of the highlights from their report. Uh, so I want to welcome, welcome uh, and why don't you introduce yourself to the committee. Um, and I guess, uh, you know what might be good is if you take the these, you know, this microphone and whatever that. Yeah, and then you can take the one that's there and use those. Uh, so. well, if I could just say something, I'm going to leave. We have two very young citizens, ah. Andrew and Julia Casino, who are sitting in the very back, <laughs> who are listening attentively, <laughs> and uh, they are going to be fantastic participants in the future. So thank you very much for your patience and forbearance and well as far as bothered with this event. Thank you for coming. <laughs> so much everyone for having us today. I just want to introduce my team. My name is Rachel Barden. This is Jeremy Levkoff right here. He's been a clicker. Um, Christine Fulton and Melissa Stevenson. And we just recently graduated from University of NYU. <laughs> University. <laughs> University of NYU. Um, already forgotten. It's like a month away and I'm done. Um, at Wagner School of Public Service. And um, <laughs> So this was our capstone uh, project that we're going to share with you our presentation. Um, so the purpose of our report and this presentation today was to um, identify who is not voting in New York City and what can be done. And so we're presenting new research um, that's based on analysis of two very different elections. We had the 2008 presidential election and the 2009 mayoral election. Um, and so we chose these years because they were the most recent presidential and mayoral elections um, that we could study in New York City. And so we thought they would be the most useful in order to, you know, inform targeted outreach for the upcoming presidential and mayoral elections. Um, at the same time, we recognize that they're very different. Um, 2008 was high profile. It was an African-American candidate. That was very exciting. Um, 2009 was lackluster third-term mayor. So. We recognize that there could be, you know, that's, that's something to think about um, in our analysis, but we use this to inform our upcoming elections. So, 
the purpose of this um, analysis was to address the problem that we've discussed all day, which is the low voter turnout in New York City relative to um, the nation and the state. Um, so this shows low tur turnout among eligible citizens um, nationwide in 2010. There was about 45% turnout. And then if we look at New York State excluding New York City, we see above 50% turnout among eligible citizens. Um, however, in New York City, uh, turnout was below 30%. So prior to um, creating our statistical analysis, we wanted to identify who has been, like who the researchers have said, you know, does and does not vote, and what socioeconomic and demographic characteristics they found. So it's important to note that many of these variables actually interact with one another, as you might expect. Um, so age is, was found to be highly correlated with voting, uh, with younger, younger eligible citizens voting less, and they define that as 18 to 29. Um, but they found that education can impact uh, voter turnout amongst younger voters as well, with more educated voters or younger people coming out at higher, at higher numbers. Um, gender also influences turnout. Um, a higher proportion of women have voted in uh, presidential elections since 1980 than um, men. Um, income also highly associated with turnout, but again, this uh, may be a reflection of the association between education and turnout. Um, studies have also shown that racial and ethnic minorities vote at lower rates than whites, but some researchers attribute this to differences in education and income and not race. And naturalized citizens have also been identified as turning out lower and that in lower rates. And then residential mobility has been found to be a high predictor of turnout because people who have to change when they move, they change addresses, and then you have to um, change your voter registration. So we also found that there's um, several non-demographic factors that have been associated with turnout. Um, some have found that people with disabilities have a perception that the poll sites will not be as accessible and this may influence their, their coming out to the polls. Um, researchers have identified a group effect, so the people who belong to clubs or religious institutions have come out more to vote. Um, married couples have been shown to vote at higher rates. Uh, union members have also been shown to vote more frequently than non-union members. And apathy has been identified as a common obstacle to voting. People say that they um, don't care, they're too busy, it's inconvenient. And finally, um, just establishing a habit of voting very early on can be a great predictor of turnout later. So these are some of the things we kept in mind when conducting our analysis of turnout, which uh, Melissa will talk about. Hi. Um, so for our analysis of New York City, uh, uh, we started by looking at how different socioeconomic and demographic factors influence turnout in the 2008 and 2009 general elections, as Rachel already stated. So it's important to note that in our analysis, we um, use the census tract as the unit of analysis. So we were looking at turnout rates in census tracts and how they are associated with different uh, socioeconomic and demographic factors, which were in percentages. So um, we also so that eligible voters are citizens age 18 and older. Those are estimates of the number of citizens in each tract in New York City. And our data came from the Board of Elections, their voter rolls, which include addresses, which is how we got the census tracts. And um, also our other variables are from the Census Bureau estimates. So this is just a, an overview of the common uh, results we found in both 2008 and 2009, despite those two being very different elections. We did find that there was lower turnout among certain groups, or in other words, um, as the percent of an area increases, as these groups increase in an area of New York City, turnout we saw decrease. So the youth, ages 18 to 29, as expected, low turnout. Uh, the less educated, which we defined as high school diploma or less, as the maximum educational attainment. Men, people who lived in their home less than one year, um, as in they were in a different home over a year ago. Naturalized citizens as opposed to native born citizens. And married couple families actually had a negative uh, association with turnout, which was the one real surprising thing that came up in our results. But it was in both 2008 and 2009. Um, and government workers, which was kind of strange, we uh, included government workers as sort of a proxy for civic engagement or union membership, which 
we couldn't uh, get that at the census tract level in our data, so we used government workers, but it was uh, negative in both years. Oh, I cut off a little, sorry. Um, so there were some key differences between 2008 and 2009, although not that many, to be honest. Um, in 2008, the percent Asian actually was associated with a negative turnout. Um, but in 2009, that there was no association between turnout and Asian, whereas on the flip side, percent Latino actually increased turnout when we were when all their factors were equivalent. So this is taking into account all the simultaneous influences of all these different factors at once. So uh, Latino actually increased turnout, but again in 2009 there was no effect. And uh, percent Black had a stronger positive effect in 2008, but it was also positive in 2009. Um, so this kind of indicates that maybe focusing on race and ethnicity isn't the best uh, way of uh, targeting voter outreach, um, whereas education and naturalization and sometimes language barriers are more important. Um, but uh, language barriers did have decreased turnout in 2008, but we didn't see an effect in 2009. Um, male also had a stronger a stronger effect in 2008, and then in 2009, the only other difference we saw was um, it increased travel time to work, so as the average amount of time that people in an area are commuting to work, um, as that increased, they had decreased, in, decreased turnout in 2009 in the mayoral election, but not in 2008. And this is just an overview of the turnout rates that we estimated uh, broken down by census tract, you can see red has the highest, um, although there are only a few that are in that high one. <laughs> a lot are in that green and the orange. And you can kind of see it's pretty scattered throughout the city. There isn't you know, one borough that's all red or all blue. So and then you can um, look at these maps in more detail in the report. Um, it be easier to look at. And this is 2009, so it is a little different. You can see a lot of red up in Manhattan. So. Um, and a lot more blue in the outer barrow. So it definitely, there are some differences, although when you look at the, the demographics and the socioeconomic traits all at once, there are a lot of similarities between the two. And now Christine will talk about our recommendations. Um, so in some of our research, we also wanted to look at some structural reforms that we thought could have a potential impact on the target groups that we uncovered. Um, so we looked at three in particular, uh, no excuse absentee voting, election day registration, and simplifying the ballot. So first we'll sort of take a step back and look across the country. Um, early, early voting for our purposes today is sort of all structural um, availability for early voting, so that could be a multitude of things, but um, as you can see, New York doesn't offer any. Um, so we will switch slides. So, no excuse absentee voting actually comes in two options. There's permanent and non-permanent. Um, so permanent, you sign up to receive a ballot, and then that with every subsequent election, that's mailed to your home. And with non-permanent, you have to do it with each, with each election. So for the purposes of what our analysis uncovered, we found that people often said that they were too busy or couldn't get off work, um, so they didn't have a under New York's umbrella of uh, absentee, an appropriate reason to be an absentee voter. So we think that this would, um, in, in addition to helping the highly mobile, which obviously New York renters tend to move quite a bit more than the, the average, average bear, um, mm -hmm. we thought that that would be particularly helpful for them, as well as people who do shift work or um, have a hard time getting off, during the, getting off work during the nine to six slot. Um, for election day registration, it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. You can register to vote um, the same day and do that all at your poll site. Uh, so again, we're sort of hitting those hitting those groups who may move more than more than others. Um, naturalized citizens we found often aren't registered in the appropriate window. Um, also, some research uncovered that um, the media hype and, and public engagement happened before within the window of, uh, excuse me, uh, happen within the window of registration being closed. So in New York, that's three weeks up to the election. So there's really often a huge push by candidates, by media outlets for 
you know, get out to vote and people realize they're not registered and therefore cannot vote. So we thought that this would be a way to incorporate and, and grab some of those voters who may be a little bit behind. behind. Um, simplify the ballot was something we saw a lot. We did a, um, we did a survey of community groups. Um, it was cited often that um, the ballot design was, was difficult for people and that just an easier, more straightforward ballot would make them more confident in the voting experience. So again, confidence um, and a positive experience we thought would hit all New Yorkers. Um, and yeah, so that is a little snapshot of our <coughs> presentation. We are happy to feel any questions. There's also, um, looks like there's copies of our report if anyone wants to delve in a bit more to some of the issues we covered. Wonderful presentation. You know, I think when they put into the city charter that there would be a voter assistance commission, I think that's what they expected them to produce this kind of work. But, um, and so you've done a wonderful presentation. Let me ask you a question about what's not there. Did you give any thought to competitive elections encouraging voter turnout? Because you could do an analysis there. Um, that, yeah, that question has come up, um, and there are also, I mean, there are a lot of things that were not included that could have been included, but um, we, in order to do that, I think, we would have had to compare more elections and just we had a, a bit of a time limitation being that this was done during our academic year. So that would be great for further research to compare more elections, especially between more competitive elections. I think that that's a pretty on point. Yeah. And a, a lot of the research we found said that when an election was more competitive, turnout was higher. So it's definitely a, a worthwhile option to look into with, without the time. Yeah, and something that was interesting was that in 2009, we found, as um, Melissa mentioned, that travel time, as that increased um, in a census tract to commute to work, um, then, um, then registration, or not registration, then voter turnout decreased. So that we found like a logical, like when the, the election was less exciting to people, that people did vote less based on like, you know, convenience. So um, definitely that's an area that should be explored more. And we have all the data, and we plan to continue to do more research, and, and that is definitely one of the areas to look at. Are you all, do you all graduate? Yes. 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 You have to decide. Okay. <laughs> Actually, we have not many of them. Are, are, are any of you planning on continuing in this field of work? Many of them work with yeah, the city. So one way or another, yeah. Already, <laughs> yeah. Definitely, mm -hmm. I turn to Paul when I see Alan uh, Dean Shaw, then I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll let her know that, that you should pass. <laughs> 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 and, uh, I appreciate that. I'm part of the uh, Reynolds Fellowship Program as an advisor. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So I believe we have, um, uh, to turn this over to public testimony, um, um, I have uh, uh, Marjorie Shea from the Women's City Club and Rachel Faust from the Citizens Union. Um, are there any others who are here to uh, testify? So Marjorie, you have the floor. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to revise my testimony somewhat because this kind of report is exactly what I found missing in your work, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that. You should all have... Well, thinking, we're going to take credit for what they did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we already have. We, we hired them. So you have a <laughs> copy of my um, testimony in, yes. in front of you, and there, there are a couple of extra over, over there, but I want to thank you, Chairman Shane, for this hearing on the annual report of the New York City Campaign Finance Board Voter Assistance Unit. As you know, Women's City Club um, has was supported the successful 2010 referendum to incorporate voter service within the Campaign Finance Board. 
and we welcome the chance to evaluate your first annual report. And I thought the best way to do this would be perhaps to look at the charter and see what the charter assigns you tasks. And the charter gives you seven items that you're supposed to do. Um, and um, we could discuss them. Number one is encourage and facilitate voter registration and voting by all residents of New York City. Um, while it's soon to, too soon to tell about voting rates, I mean, we, we need a full four-year cycle, I think, to actually make some comparisons and see how effective your work is. But you've done an excellent job in this area, um, particularly what you've done with your online voter guides now that they cover congressional special elections and this year's presidential and congressional primaries, um, I think that's uh, very good. And your proposal to have paperless voter registration, I think we could use really mount a campaign on that issue. And I think more research has to be done and we've been talking about it for a long time. The good government groups have talked about this. Other states do it. Uh, we need to hear more about uh, cost, experience in other states, and security. Uh, and uh, okay, the second thing they the Charter says is identify groups or categories of residents who are underrepresented among those registered and voting. Well, you've done that. I suggest that you partner with city academic institutions such as the Wagner School. I did not know about this report at that time when I, when I wrote, wrote this. Um, number three, coordinate activities of all city agencies and educate the youth. You've done an excellent job in this area, working with the youth and military voters and monitoring agency-based registrations. Number four, make recommendations to government officials and bodies to improve voting rates. Um, I think for the first time we've seen the voter assistance unit actually coming out there and acting on some legislation. And I think when this was put in the charter, I think that's what they expected you to do, make some proposals to, um, and, but we all know it's, you've got to change the election law through New York State. And there is a resistance there because sitting, le sitting legislators are reluctant to uh, change the status quo that got them elected in the first place. Um, number five, facilitate voting by eligible residents of U New York City who are limited in English proficiency. Um, and you suggest that, and Women's City Club agrees with you, that your recommendation to simplify distribution of non-English voting materials by allowing voters to select their language preference as part of voter registration and maintain this information in the Board of Elections database. As you point out, over distributing is costly, it's confusing, it leads to having a ballot with font size that's microscopic and no kidding, in some Queens districts they had a, um, a magnifying glass so that people could read the ballot. There's no reason. LA does not do that. And they, I think they have some 10 languages or something. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you're right, and that's another area that we should um, pursue. Number six, prepare and publish reports. Um, and again, uh, the charter says that you are to publish statistics on the number and characteristics of citizens registered and unregistered um, during the previous primary, general, and special elections. 
I don't know if that has been done or not, but again, I think it takes the resources of a Wagner School or the Pew Center for the Chip of the States. Um, but somewhere, we need good statistics to make a proper policy. Number seven, receive citizen complaints. And you've done an, a good job of including us in your uh, meetings and listening to um, the voters' uh, complaints. and. Uh, so as we move forward into the June 26th congressional primary, <clears throat> we uh, congratulate you because on your website you have sort of a mini voter guide. You tell us that there are seven um, House of Representatives races and one, the Republicans get to vote all over the state for U.S. Senate. Um, and so, and your links to the candidates' websites, very easy way to put out a voter guide and, and let the citizen, the voter, look, look it up. So um, that's, that's very good. I think we need more information on poll site changes. There are going to be some poll site changes. Plus, there are going to be differences with new congressional district numbers. The numbers are changing, the outlines of the districts are changing, and I think you have a link in your website to the LATFOR site, which is very difficult to use, by, by the way. Yeah. But we're going to need some more information about those new um, districts. Um, and um, the uh, let's see. Okay, um, I, I think as we move forward, uh, I see some new energy, new movement here, and it's wonderful. Very, very great. Thank you, Marjorie. <laughs> Any questions? I actually just wanted to I mean, take the opportunity, since Marjorie was so nice to thank uh, so many of the projects that we've done, to thank the people who happen to be sitting in the room right now who are responsible. I mean, I could easily take all responsibility for this, but obviously I don't. Um, but everybody knows Anita, who, you know, really, you know, the enthusiasm is amazing. But her staff, uh, Cheyenne Sapp, who is our youth voter coordinator, and uh, Stuart, who is who handles coordinating all of our agency work, so all of the of things that we've seen at the agencies, and they're overseen by Shauna Dickinson, who is our deputy director of operations, and um, Eric Friedman, who is our, our, our external affairs director, who also worked with our capstone group to produce this wonderful report. Bonnie, who does our all of our tweeting for us, <laughs> <laughs> um, and. Uh, Crystal and uh, Kristen, who, Crystal and Kristen, <laughs> who are both are responsible for doing the web, uh, this uh, web streaming, but also are responsible for doing the website and that great voter guide that you saw on the um, website. So I wanted to just thank all of them, and of course we're always supported by our legal staff and and the entire staff of our to produce the publications and all the work that we do but I just wanted to thank the people who are in the room for all the really hard work that they did. And thank you for the nice things that you said about us. So Rachel Fowles. And I didn't have anyone to have this too. Because, oh, okay. So oh, I don't want to just give it to you now. Okay. Good evening, I'm Chair Chang and other members of the Voter Assistance and Advisory Committee. My name is Rachel Foss and I'm the Policy and Research Manager for Citizens Union of the City of New York. And we're a nonpartisan good government group dedicated to making democracy work for all New Yorkers. And thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. And you know, I thought it was very interesting to hear about all the different initiatives and well, I thought it was a good overview of a lot of the things they're working on for you know, both in the past, but also going into the future. So I enjoyed the beginning portion of the meeting. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about your annual report, but with a focus on the policy recommendations in particular. Um, but, you know, I think the annual report outlines it's an ambitious but extremely important agenda for the city in terms of voter participation. And it outlines many significant initiatives that, that BAC has undertaken 
um, many of which, which began under its uh, former structure. Um, we support Max's emphasis on technology and leveraging partnerships. So they're smart and a cost-effective means of engaging more New Yorkers regarding the voting process. Um, regarding leveraging data, just as a side note, Citizens Union has also worked with Capstone teams and had really great results in the past. Um, I didn't know you were going to be presenting it um, tonight either, but you know I look forward to reviewing it. And we've had you know great success in the past with our Capstone teams. Um, and we look forward to also seeing some of your other initiatives in action, um, the Taxi TV reminders, for example, and the increased promotion of the NYC Votes brand. Um, and like I mentioned, I'd like to focus a little bit more on the recommendations of the report at this point. Um, regarding the report, the recommendations that you made in the specifically in the report um, regarding online voter voter registration, automatic registration, and pre-registration of youth voters. Um, we've been working with Assemblymember Kavanaugh on legislation that, to implement these goals, and we haven't formally supported the legislation, but we are currently discussing it and looking at ways to um, ensure that any administrative hurdles can be overcome and that its effectiveness is maximized, but it is something that we are examining. Um, we do support same-day registration and election day registration. Um, as well as no absentee, no excuse absentee voting and early voting. Um, and additionally, you know, providing voters with better information is a very important goal, and we're very pleased that you've supported Councilmember Inez Dickens' Bill um, 613, which would, um, intro 613, which would provide email notifications to voters. Um, and regarding other proposals in, in the area of, of voter information, um, we support the efforts you spoke about improving the design of the ballot, and again, we are working with Assemblymember Kavanaugh on the Voter-Friendly Ballot Act, so that's something we're also working on. Um, and on the point of allowing voters to select the language of choice when they're registering, a sort of a side point to this that we think would be very important is that something that's being discussed is bilingual ballots. So I think it's not just the informational ma mailings that um, voters will get, will get in the different languages. It's also, I think, the ballot. If they do indeed move to a bilingual ballot, having the data on where they need to be targeted will help to lower their costs, since there are going to be different ballots produced, more ballots produced, but more types of ballots produced, but fewer, hopefully, in, in the end. Um, so just as a side note to that point. Um, but, you know, one thing we'd really like to, to emphasize today is additional legislative proposals for, for the Commission to consider. I know that Commissioner Casino spoke to many of the ones I'm about to speak to now. Um, but having reviewed your report, I think a lot of the goals of the legislation that I'm going to mention that Citizens Union supports, they really are very much in line with the recommendations you already have in your report regarding voter participation and access and, and greater information. Um, but this package of bills is currently in the City Council and um, Citizens Union is working with a coalition of groups around these bills. I know, again, Commissioner Casino mentioned the need to bring groups together, and we've started to do that. Um, so at the moment, um, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, Bren Brennan Center for Justice, DEMOS, League of Women Voters, New York City, and New York Public Interest Research Group, along with Citizens Union, are supporting um, this package of bills that I'm about to mention. Um, so the first you know, is the bill by Councilmember Anais Dickens, which you already support, so I'm not going to go into the details of that. Um, the second one is Intro 721, sponsored by Councilmember Lappin, to establish a poll worker program to give incentives to municipal employees to work on Election Day. Um, you know, in your report, you mentioned that staffing poll sites with qualified, well-trained poll workers is, is a significant challenge, and we think that this bill provides a simple and effective solution to the poll worker problem um, to help improve the voter experience which is, a, again, a goal we share. Um, the next bill is Intro 728, sponsored by Councilmember Greenfield, which would require voter registration forms to be provided to parents enrolling children in school. Um, you, in your report, proposed ideas such as online registration and automatic voter registration to make voter registration easier. I think this is just another way of doing that. This is another way of getting at another um, audience of, of people in terms of outreach. The next bill is Intro 760, sponsored by Councilmember Williams, that would require the City Board of Elections to report for particular city agencies the number of New Yorkers who completed registration forms while seeking services. Um, and you know, this 
information, if provided, would better allow the city to target better voter registration efforts and agencies um, that are producing the more, most voter registration forms, but also allowing um, the VAC to work with agencies that might not be doing as much with regard to voter registration. Um, and, and given your many partnerships with city agencies, and then you specifically mentioned um, the Office of Mayor's Office of Veteran Services, I might have the name a little bit wrong there, but you know, I think given that effort and other efforts, this type of information would be very helpful for you. Um, the next bill is Intro 769, introduced by Councilmember Eugene, which would expand the city's voter guide to include more city races and state and federal elections so voters are more informed about all the contests on the ballot. Um, you know, I think there's been some discussion today about your efforts around the June 26th congressional primaries. Um, you know, you've also done more with regard to the special elections earlier this year. Um, so we really see this as an extension and a formalization of the work that you've already started to do. Um, so I think that, you know, it's again a goal we both share. And the, the last bill is Intro 778, sponsored by, sponsored by Councilmember Lander to require the City Board of Elections to report data required by the Mayor's Management Report to the City Council. Um, and this is really about increased accountability in government. Um, and I think without accountability, it's hard to know where to tar target efforts and without proper information. So I think this again gets to some of the, many of the core issues we've talked about, we've been hearing about in today's meeting. Um, you know, I think given the alignment between VAC's goals outlined in its annual report and the goals of the package of legislation supported by Citizens Union and our other civic colleagues, we urge the VAC to formally support these bills by passing a resolution as it did for the Dickens bill and to indicate its support to the City Council for the entire package of legislation in concept if not for every you know, particular provision of the bills. I think the first step is to get you know, a public hearing perhaps on these bills to talk about ways to make them better and improve them and make, make sure to maximize their effectiveness. So and I think a, a gesture of support in, in terms of a resolution would be extremely important to help these move these issues forward. Um, so thank you again for the opportunity to provide testimony and to listen to the good presentations earlier this evening. I have a question. Um, in my professional life, one of the things I do besides voting rights is immigration. And I'm really interested in bilingual ballots. Has you has Susan you know, did any research as to how difficult it would be to have bilingual ballots given the new electronic voting would it be very costly? Because we get a lot of um, complaints at our office about the limitations, you know, because the Voting Rights Act provides in certain provisions, but you have to reach a certain level. But there are a lot of communities who may or may not have reached that level, but they're certainly visible enough to like have uh, a ballot in their language. I'm typically thinking of the Haitians and the Russians. Sure. Um, well, I know that in terms of the cost, this is something that the City Board of Elections has been doing quite a bit of their own analysis of. Mm -hmm. And I know it's something that's been discussed and if they haven't formally voted on it yet. Um, I know it's all, the concept of bilingual ballots, you know, I think it's being discussed at the state level as well in terms of ballot changes that they're seeking to make it simpler and easier to vote. So I think these efforts are, you know, kind of intertwined. Um, you know, we don't have the data ourselves to do the analysis, but I know that the board is, is doing that in consideration of how to, how to move forward. Um, and I think you're right, there, it's, the board could go beyond the, the five required language. There's languages and there could be more. And I think by having more information and, and specific targeting, you know, it's not necessarily an overwhelming cost. You could actually probably reduce costs if you do it the right way. Thank you. I have a question just right now. Um, in terms of the legislation, um, you mentioned obviously us uh, potentially putting forward a resolution in support of, of legislation. You referenced us potentially pushing for hearings I'm curious just your thoughts generally on roles that the, the VAC can play generally in uh, just providing support if there are pieces of legislation that we decide to get behind, what you think sort of a big picture role might be for this coalition you, or for this committee, you indicated that you have a coalition that you've been building, um, sort of what needs you think if there are pieces of legislation that we decide to back? Sure, I mean I think 
because VAC has already done so much great partnering with community organizations throughout New York City, I think there would be different constituencies that might want to speak at these hearings beyond those that we've reached out to. So I think because of the outreach that you have and the wide network that you're building, um, reaching out to additional civic groups would be certainly helpful. And I think the more people that are even aware that there are bills in the city council and things moving forward, the, the more helpful they could be to sort of help make it cross the finish line. Um, you know, I think Marjorie spoke to your role and in terms of the charter and how you make recommendations regarding policy. I think having this report having recommendations, I think you, know, you can build on that work and continue to, to think of new policy proposals and you know, perhaps engage with more groups in terms of you know, what are the, the priorities of different communities throughout the city you know, before releasing your annual report. That's, that's one suggestion, but you know, if there are other thoughts, I'd certainly be happy to follow up with you later if I, you know, we think, about, think more about them, I guess. Well, um, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for your great audience as well. Are there, um, is there a motion to, uh, to include this meeting? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.